Well, Mr. Tchaikovsky, how are you getting on with your 1811 overture? Terrible. The way it is going, it won't be finished till next year. <laughs> And we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, and Joan Sims in. Oh, stop messing around. Oh, hello and welcome. Well, this week I've definitely decided to hold it in Hyde Park. <laughs> Open air concert. I'm going to be free and inhibited. Do my own thing. Oh, well, I can't imagine anyone doing it for you. <laughs> you don't understand, dear. That's trendy chat, cos I'm heavy. I'm a wear man. <laughs> obviously aware. not aware that I'm a woman. I'm aware of it, Joan. Oh, Hugh. Oh. If I said you had an absolutely gorgeous figure, would you hold it against me? <laughs> oh, yes, please. Oh, here we go. Instant orgy. Every week you two get together and orgy. Mm. Oh, come on, stop it. I'll pack it in. Everyone back to their own beds. <laughs> oh, all right. But, Joan, try and remember where I was up to. <laughs> For later. Oh, yeah. Make a chalk mark. <laughs> no need to be sarcastic. Well, it gets right up your nose, you two necking away while I'm standing here getting all excited. Well, you shouldn't watch. Excited about my news. I have joined an underground group. Northern Line or Central? <laughs> an underground pop group. We're called the Great Unwashed. There's Gravy Isaacs on rhythm guitar, Sinker Muldoon on the organ, and the drummer's got his initials on great big letters on his bass drum. <laughs> What's his name? Bernard Ogilvy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I appear as lead vocals, Penny Whistle and Mascot. You sing beautifully. Do you want to hear me do that old folk song, Where Has All the Crumpet Gone? <laughs> Flowers mean nothing to me. I'm all male. <laughs> I told you he's changed lately. <laughs> I love his T-shirt, though, don't you? Those protest slogans all over it. It's got, love your enemies on the front side and kiss your friends. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Careful. So there's only four of you in this group, Oh, then? no, five. I forgot to mention the leader. He's a great big ugly fellow with hair down to his shoulders and he plays jumbo guitar, stripped to the waist, wearing pink fluorescent trousers and psychedelic thigh boots. <laughs> Sounds as if he looks horrible. Ooh. Actually, Miss Sims, I think I look rather fetching. <laughs> Douglas, if not you. Well, frankly, Mr. Paddock, it's amazing what one can do with a shoulder-length wig and a flower painted on the chest and flashing your plectrum all over the place. <laughs> Quite honestly, I need the extra money. Well, so do I, but there's no need to tell everybody. <laughs> Hurry up, make an announcement, quick. OK, man, now, folk, dig this. <laughs> This week, Cracker Jack and Ollie with Mother has moved down to the bottom of the garden. And in her size 10 wellies, here comes blooming Maud Nethersoul. Hello, Tinies, and Biggies too. What is it that's more fun when it's done in the open air? <laughs> it's telling stories, isn't it? Well, if you've any better ideas, let me know. Anyway, there was once a little worm called William who wasn't sure which end of him was which. <laughs> so he never had any girlfriends. <laughs> then one day, when he was tunnelling under the lawn, he suddenly heard the sound of marching feet and someone whistling Colonel Bogey. <laughs> and there, all at once, was a rather butch centipede called Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> she said. <laughs> What's wrong with you, young fella, me lad? You're looking very down in the mouth. I presume that is your mouth. <laughs> I certainly hope so. 
said William. I've been shoving food into it all morning. <laughs> and he began telling her his troubles. Meanwhile, in another part of the lawn, a worm called Marilyn was telling her mother that she was just popping out for a quick wiggle. <laughs> well, be careful of the starlings, love, said her mother, because I don't I think our early bird warning system is working. <laughs> I don't want you to get nipped in the middle and come back twins. <laughs> well, Marilyn hadn't got far when she found she was face to face with William's tail, which suddenly lit up like a beacon. You see, Tinies, William's mother had never told him that he was really a glowworm. She kept it dark because his father had been a passing firefly. <laughs> and she'd forgotten to ask his name. Anyway, William and Marilyn got married, but Marilyn didn't enjoy the wedding night because William would keep putting on his light to read in bed. <laughs> now, wasn't that a lovely story? <laughs> and uh, here's a song about a lovesome thing to wit a garden. In an English garden, beside a garden seat, I met an English gardener with galoshes on his feet. He showed me his sweet William. <laughs> then offered me a rose and asked me if I'd like to try the sprinkler on his hose. <laughs> Before. And so we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables. And our story with the moral this week is a western set in Dodge City, so called because if you didn't, you were dead. <laughs> Hank Hourglass. I'm an old timer. <laughs> I've been the bartender at the Bricklayer's Arms Saloon, so called because it's a good place to go and get plastered. <laughs> I'm stirring myself a screwdriver with a screwdriver because we run out of spoons. When in walk the sheriff. Howdy, Hank. Howdy. I got a hankering for some food and drink. Uh, I can fix you some mess. Well, I'll deal with the thirst first and have a plate of tater later. <laughs> has been so good up to now. <laughs> Say, Hank, get back into character, will you, and listen to me. I hear tell that Zack is riding this way. <gasps> Zack? You mean the fastest gun in the West? The man who's made a vow to kill you, Marshal? The man who said he'll shoot you in the end? <laughs> <laughs> yup. Yup. <laughs> Just because I sent him up for five years. Yeah, he could never take a joke. That's it. <laughs> hey, Marshal, here comes your wife, Mary Lou. Clint, Clint, oh, yeah. I hear the black sack is riding this way. Which way? This way, and he's mighty sore. <laughs> well, if he's riding that way, I ain't surprised. <laughs> but don't you realize that I used to be his girl? And after you... <laughs> for five years, you married me, and now he's coming back to kill you. Clint, don't you know what that means? <laughs> yep. <laughs> means we got a fairly efficient plot going for us. Have you no fear? He's a killer, Clint. A huge hunk of a man with cold, brutal eyes. And if he walked through that door now, he'd square his massive shoulders and say... I know. I know. <laughs> Stand back, Black Zack. 
Geek. Get, get beside Mary Lou and put your hands up. Marshal, someone shut a hole in the door of Calamity Jane's bathroom. Hey, 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 who are you? That's my other part. <laughs> the bartender. Oh, he's got a memory like a sieve. I'll start again and try to pay attention. Oh, sorry. Hey, Marshal, someone shut a hole in the door of Calamity Jane's bathroom. <laughs> then I guess I'd better go and look into it. Uh, uh, see? I mean, you could have ruined that joke. <laughs> oh, Zach, now we're alone. I want you to do something for me that only a real man can do. Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> we may be alone, but anyone could walk in and catch us. I mean, forget this vendetta and spare his life. For me. I'll let your husband off as long as I can spend ten minutes alone. You know, really alone with you. Oh. Ten minutes? Yes, after I'm not only the fastest gun in the West. <laughs> then, then come up to my house I'll this evening. Your house. Because it's yeah. Friday, yeah. and that means there's an easy way to get rid of my husband. How do you mean? Well, it's our bath night, and if I have my bath first, then he'll go in and stay for ages and ages. But how can you be sure? Well, because the moral of this week's story is... Oh, yeah, you baths last, baths longest. <laughs> In this do-it-yourself age, how does it feel to live next door to an expert do-it-yourselfer? Take the case of Sid and Rita Dipfinger. Sid! You know that Mrs. Ogden next door? Have you had a look at her back area recently? <laughs> no, I can't say I have, Rita. Oh, she's had it all blasted. <laughs> Yes, her Abby did it, see. Now she's got a regular little sun trap, according to the milkman. How does he know? Well, yesterday morning, her yoghurt exploded. <laughs> oh, well, if it's done that to her yoghurt, what'll it do to her dustbins? <laughs> Remember what they were like last summer? I didn't dare go into the garden without taking a deep breath and wearing a tin hat. Oh, she's moved all her dustbins into her now. But they'll clash with the wallpaper, Rita. Oh, no, she's made chintz covers for them, dear. But it's not very nice, is it? I mean, it's one thing to have dustbins in the hall like we do, but I mean, in the loud. Oh, she's moved all her best pieces onto that Spanish patio that her hubby made. Well, Spanish patio, indeed. All he did was to hang a bunch of onions on her bow front <laughs> and stick a moustache on, on her plastic gnome. Looks ridiculous, especially as the house is called Balmoral. <laughs> and now he's planning to insulate her loft by filling all the cavities with expanded Polynesia. <laughs> well, I say this for her, Abby. He'll have a go at anything. He will. That's why she keeps him busy around the house. <laughs> on and let it draw. <laughs> oh, no, but serious, Serious? I'll tell you what does need doing, Sid. Oh, what's that, Rita? Why don't you double glaze the telly, dear? <laughs> With all the recording companies putting out cut-price LPs, you can now hear a superlative rendering of your favourite piece for as little as 14 and 11 pence.
Uh, it seems a bit ironic that we're still lumbered with the Maxi Length Harris Male Voice Choir. It's better not to open up your ink and sing. It's better not to hear the Omi voices ring. would like to make an announcement of special interest to all lovers of rhapsodic expertise, wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> yes, you would. No, no, give out a record. No, no. Oh, oh, that, yes, yes. yes. Well. well, well, we decided to slash the price of our top-selling LP. Yes, we are. We're slashing it, we slash are. It. <laughs> yes. So instead of it being two fourpence, it's now two bob. That's right. What a bargain, bargain ducky bargain. Of course, if you buy the sleeve as well, it's five pound ten. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I had a lot of trouble designing that sleeve, you didn't did, I? You did. Yes. Oh, no lie. No lie. No. <laughs> well, I mean, them puff sleeves are always a problem, aren't they? <laughs> and if you get them too tight, they stop your circulation. Mm. You know? mm. More than that to stop your circulation. <laughs> yes, it's shameful the way you've been going around trying to plug that record, well. trying to bribe Tony with a knitting pattern. <laughs> well, I thought it would send up our sales. Mm, wasn't our sales that got sent up, was it? <laughs> hole in the roof, wasn't there? Yes. Go on. <laughs> yes. From the beans. Yes. No, it was me, really. Yes, no, it was, no, wasn't well, it? I, well, I didn't know his speciality was crochet work. Crochet. <laughs> crochet. Well, I'd like to know the name of this week's vocal extra. Travaganza. Well, Chuck. <laughs> um, <laughs> we thought our fans would appreciate something, something a bit butch to really lift the roof off. <laughs> so, what did you choose? Dance of the Sugar Plum Fair. <laughs> but unfortunately, the poor Pallone has pulled a ligament in her lally. Well, that's on her fret, she did. So, yes. we're doing something different. Yes. Oh, good. Yes, it's a song about another sugar plum fairy. Mm. No, we're not back to that. Yes, we are, Miss Clever Clogs, and if you don't want it, then you do. Cheek. Nerve. There's a little fairy who hasn't a friend. She has been deserted by her fairy prince. Who wonders where her chum is, where her sugar plum is. She lent it to a leprechaun and hasn't seen it since. There's a little fairy halfway round the bend Searching for her boyfriend over hill and pond Said she has been jilted, that her wings have wilted All that she's got now is a bent wand <laughs> Searching in the daffodils and searching in the hollyhock And searching in oh, the hollyhocks I'll searching bits <laughs> If you haven't found the answer at your age, you never will <laughs> <laughs> Charming. Mm, get on with it. There's a little fairy still all on her own, sitting in a buttercup where bees do buzz. Oh, wishing someone bone up would hurry up and phone up. Oh, I know the feeling, love. Well, if you, <laughs> well, if you don't, Ducky, who does? <laughs> Now it's time for the Smith Report. But first, here is a Gale warning. Ernest Gale, stay away from my wife! <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to this week's main topic. Literature. Do we read too much into it? Now, what does the man in the street have to say? I am able to read a large amount of literature as I recently took one of those speed reading courses. With my new ability, I've just completed Tolstoy's War and Peace in only 35 minutes. That's fantastic. What's the book about? Uh, Russia. <laughs> well, you know, I always say the pen is mightier than the sword. So if I ever come against a fellow with a sword, I squirt ink in his eye. <laughs> work, my boss gave me an instruction manual which explained in detail how I could make myself most helpful and popular in a small but busy office. Oh yes, and what was it called? Fanny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so much for public opinion, but what are the views of an expert? As chairman of the local watch committee, I find that so-called literature these days is obsessed with sex. Stories of full-bosomed, <laughs> lithe-bodied, mini-skirted young women fleshing their, their thighs in the summer sunshine and leaping into bed to the flimsiest, I repeat, flimsiest excuse. I have just read a book that was so erotic and pornographic and sexually explicit that I took it straight back to the public library and renewed it. <laughs> It's a very strange thing that many mystery story writers are women. How does this unlikely profession affect their married life? Hello, darling. I've got the afternoon off. Roger, darling, isn't that lucky? Stay there by the door, will you? Uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda, what? Now, what? now see if you can get to the telephone. <laughs> But you... <laughs> Short mail. Well, for my story, I want to know if a middle-aged man in an average-sized room can get from the door to the telephone by the French window with a bullet wound three inches above the heart. compiled has been a list of the world's thinnest books. Uh, this list is headed by a very thin book called Italian War Heroes. <laughs> but perhaps the thinnest mystery book of them all is Who Killed Cock Robin? The crime, arrest and trial all dealt with in six verses flat. Few people are aware that this crime was actually solved by two of fiction's greatest detectives, Chief Superintendent Barlow and Inspector Watt. Tell me, who killed Cock Robin? I'm not saying nothing. Come on, Mrs. Fly. There's none of you on me. <laughs> I know my rights. Look, my name may be John, but I know what's what. I was nowhere near the scene of the crime. I was in a club with one of your constables sitting on my knee. Yeah, I suppose you think that gives you a copper bottom alibi. <laughs> <laughs> you try it on Mr. Barlow, who'll be here in a minute. Right then, all lads. I'm sorry I'm late. I've been investigating the theft of some paper towels from a public loo in East London. Oh, no, which one was it, sir? Oh, I don't know. Just one of the Stratford Johns. What's up now? Cock Robin's been killed. Oh. Stabbed to death with an arrow. Oh, I read about. Right between the obelisk and the bush shelter. <laughs> this is the only witness. Ah, oh, the only one, eh? I know you, lass. I want those marks on your face. Mrs. Fly, have you been done up? <laughs> You talk and I'll throw the book at you. I don't care. I warn you, it alert. It's the complete works of Shakespeare. <laughs> All right, then. I saw him die. I saw him die with my little... Ah. <laughs> little cat burglar friend, Mickey the Manx. We put a tail on him. Ah. <laughs> Come on, Mrs Fly. Who killed Cock Robin? Sparrow did it. With my archery set. I don't believe it. <laughs> Who killed Cock Robin? I said the Sparrow. With my bow and arrow. John, lad, there's only one thing to do. Get on to the BD. BD, sir? Aye, but a dust car. What for? Because this old sketch has been a right load of old rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Stop 
Missing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. in the witness. Yes, my lord. You are Brenda Carol Bowerman? Yes, I am. You are an optician? An optician, that is correct. Will you take the book in your right hand and read from the card? I S W E A R T O Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims in... Stop messing about. Hello and welcome. Well, this week they told me to come on and say a few words to you, but whatever you do, they said, don't drag it out. So I'll be brief, succinct, and to the point. Hello, Kenny. <laughs> oh, hello. You're very chirpy today, standing in that very tight sweater. Mmm, very full of yourself. <laughs> well, Hugh and I have just had a little holiday. You went to a hotel in Brighton? Oh, separate rooms, I assume. Of course. Rooms 417 and 418. With a connecting door. It wasn't like that at all. 417 was in the hotel. 418 was in the annex. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Good luck, mate. Still, we did have breakfast together, holding hands across the table. Yeah. All I got was giggles from the waitress and a fistful of marmalade. <laughs> Remember Hugh under the pier? <laughs> when you... When you took me in your arms and stripped me of all my inhibitions. We kissed, cuddled, caressed, cavorted, and then... Deck chair attendant came along and told us off. <laughs> How dare he? What did he say? Well, actually, I said, hello, hello, what's going on here? Fabulous. <laughs> it wasn't you. Well, I need the money. <laughs> and you get a free uniform. Well, maybe so, but I don't think you should wear it in the studio. <laughs> You're ridiculous in that peaked cap. Oh, I don't know. Go on, make your an announcement and I'll go and sit down. In that case, that'll be ninepence. <laughs> To continue, in the quest for new talent, we again throw open the programme to an up-and-coming youngster. And standing beside me is a young man... I, uh, I think I can... I can call you a young man. Well, I'm certainly not a girl. <laughs> a, young man, a young man who is head prefect at one of our leading schools. And uh, has recently won a prize for poetry reading. Uh, what are you going to recite for us today? The Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley. That sounds very nice. It is very nice. Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley. <laughs> there was a young man of Uganda and an elephant on his veranda. So he said to it, please, will you do a strip tease? And it did with the utmost of candor. <laughs> That's not how I remember the Ode to the West Wind. Oh, well, the wind's changed a bit since your day. <laughs> and my next poem is The Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Oh, very well, but this time I should be listening very carefully. Yes, that I try. The Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. <laughs> a greengrocer's wife down in Dorset, she kept bursting out of her... Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> That's too much. I, I really can't imagine how you came to be head prefect of one of our leading schools. Ah, uh, well, I'm not anymore, because they asked me to leave. No wonder. Which school was it? Cheltenham Ladies College. <laughs> <laughs> and to conclude, here is Sea Fever by John Maysfield. Yes, well, this time, stick to the original. No, I'll try. Mm. Sea Fever by John Maysfield. <laughs> 
I must go down to the sea again. <laughs> to the road of the sea. <laughs> And good luck to all who sail in him. <laughs> this week, Cracker Jack and Ollie with Mother has a touch of the Espanols. I'm told there's a lot of it about. So, with a Spanish mantilla stuck in her bun and a geranium... <laughs> May I go on? Thank you. And a geranium on her hacienda. <laughs> Here is Senorita Maud Nethersell. Ole! <laughs> Which means, of course, hello, tinies and biggies, too. Here is a tale of old Seville. There was once a tempestuous gypsy dancer called Doris. She had flashing eyes, flashing teeth, and her blouse was two sizes too small. <laughs> and she was so poor that she hadn't two castanets to rub together. <laughs> so when she danced, she had to keep saying, click, clickety, click. And as she had no shoes, she often shouted, stamp, 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 as well. <laughs> Which was very confusing for passing tourists, who thought she was some kind of mobile post office, and often shoved a postcard into her mouth. <laughs> now, the governor of Seville was a terrifying man, known locally as El Mucho Toro, which means a whole lot of bull. <laughs> and when he heard what was going on, he cried, I really can't have these gypsies camping all over the place. <laughs> but when he caught sight of Doris's Zapatillado, he, he stopped short in his tracks, and who can blame him? Well, when she had finished her dance, there were cries of, Bravo! And El Rubbish! <laughs> and the gardener was so astonished that he said he'd grant her any favor she cared to ask for. And Doris said, I badly need a pair of castanets and a pair of shoes. And the gardener, who was watching her closely during her dance, said, You badly need a pair of something else as well. <laughs> so, please accept these wrought iron earrings as a reward for making an old man happy. So now she no longer shouts, clickety click, stamp, stamp. She goes, rattle, rattle, rattle instead. <laughs> but as they say in Spain, hasta la vista, which means, of course, please take your stuffed olive out of my gazpacho. <laughs> and now, here's a song about an old Spanish custom. Mind you, they do it in other places as well. <laughs> but they don't use so much garlic. <laughs> In a pot, I hoped its blue would fill the room. I watered it a lot, but did it blossom? It did not. Beneath my balcony, there rode a gentleman upon a horse, and while he played his serenade. I noticed that his horse was doing something rather coarse. <laughs> so I left my balcony, took my geranium, and went below. And in its pot, I shoved the lot. <laughs> then said to it, now grow, and if it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> So we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables. And our story with the model this week is set in the days of yore. The days of my what? 
<laughs> oh, dear, I was afraid someone would have to say that. All right, it's a medieval sketch. Let's get them all out of our system before we start. Mr. Paddock. Landlord, you wouldn't send a knight out on a dog like this. <laughs> boom, boom. Mr. Williams. King Arthur, you're wanted on the throne. <laughs> also, boom, boom. Miss Sims. I am the lady imprisoned in yonder castle, and that's Shalot. <laughs> Better out than in, that's what I always say. To continue, our story this week is set in the Dark Ages. My name is Pulse, Ophelia Pulse. <laughs> My husband, Sir Richard, has been away at the Crusades these many moons, fighting the heathen infidel. Either that, or he was late back from the pub again. <laughs> Hence began my dalliance with Sir Roger de Logely. Dalliance being a medieval euphemism for a right old rave up. Ophelia. Ophelia. <laughs> Roger. Roger. My lady, I bring news of your husband. <laughs> returned from the crusades? No, you were right before he's just come back from the pub. Very well, messenger. You may leave us now. I Is that all I care? I've been practicing that voice all the week. Come on here doing that hunchback of Notre Dame walk. All for one rotten laugh. Well, think yourself lucky. I haven't had one single titter for the entire sketch. Oh, Hugh. Well, it's not fair. Oh, come on, look. Wood's got six legs and wears a bra. Peter, Paul and Mary. <laughs> there you are. That's better, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, now. Come on, now. Do you like now? Your husband returning. Should he find me here, would cleave me in twain with his broadsword. For he is a huge hulk of a man with shining armour and a vicious bent. <laughs> and if he walked in here now, he'd square his massive shoulders and he'd say... Hello. <laughs> What's going on here, then? Pretty, sir. Your lady and I were just playing around. <laughs> What? Oh, yes. Playing a round of lay. Then why weren't you on the harpsichord? We were, but it got a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> have I been deceived, duped, cuckolded, humiliated, have I, Ophelia? Am I? Am I? Yes. <laughs> what do you expect when you're always off on these crusades? Oh, has the magic gone out of our marriage? <laughs> Ten years we've been married. Ten years. Don't the three weeks we've spent together mean anything? <laughs> There's only one solution. We must meet at the tournament tomorrow and fight to the death. Very well. I shall see you there at noon. I'll make it half past, could you? It takes me hours to get me armour on. <laughs> My mouth was dry as I watched the two men position their horses for the joust. Then the flag was lowered, and from opposite ends, the pounding of hooves brought the two men closer and closer together. And in the middle of the field, they missed. <laughs> Both men turned round and tried again. I rushed to his side. It's too late, Ophelia. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. He's right, you know. He's dead. And the moral of this week's story is there's many a true word spoken in joust. <laughs> Now here's someone who, whenever he counts his blessings, feels he's been shortchanged. I refer, of course, to our problem man of the week. <laughs> My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner, and I seem to be a... I seem to be one of those... It's not at all obvious. Ah, uh, <laughs> finished. <laughs> One of those who has been given strange psychic powers. 
So what's the problem? I'd like to give them back. <laughs> you see, every night when I go to bed, I get this feeling that Lord Kitchener is trying to get in touch with me. How do you know it's Lord Kitchener? Well, it's the finger, you see. <laughs> and I also seem to hear his voice saying, Clarence J. Mouse Partner, I need you. I see. I wonder what he needs you for. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Last Tuesday night, I could bear the suspense no longer. I sat up in bed and I shouted, Tell me what to do, Lord Kitchener. Tell me what to do. And did he? No. <laughs> but the people next door did. <laughs> they shouted some very helpful suggestions through the wall. <laughs> So I decided to spend the rest of the night in the garden, in a tent, singing Land of Hope and Glory to create a suitably patriotic atmosphere, you understand? Very sensible. Okay. Any results? Several, yes. In the middle of the second verse, the tent fell down. <laughs> you know the verse I mean. Wider still and wider. Well, I, I guess. I continued singing, of course, but shortly after received a sharp blow on the back of the head. Well, not from Lord Kitchener. No. From a kindly neighbour who wished to point out that I was bivouacking in the wrong garden. <laughs> no wonder his lordship couldn't find you. <laughs> yes, and when I returned home, I found I had another little problem. Oh, not Lord Kitchener again. Well, in a way, yes. You see, during my absence, he... He... Yes? He persuaded my lady wife to join the tank corps. <laughs> Statistics tell us that more and more people are making their own wine. Some purchase the ingredients from their local chemist, while the more ambitious grow their own grapes in the window box. In either case, the results can alter one's entire way of life. Take the case of Sid and Rita Dipfinger. <laughs> I hope your airlock isn't playing you up again. <laughs> well, I wish you'd try a sip, Sid. I'd value a second opinion. No, in, in a minute, Rita. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just savouring the bouquet of, of my chateau dip finger. <laughs> well, I don't think that's a bouquet, dear. Looks to me like a bit of mould. Mould, no, Rita? Certainly not. Matter of fact, it's a, it's a broad bean. <laughs> if it must serve wine from the saucepan, I'm, I wish you'd rinse it out first. It's matured ever such a lot since yesterday, see? No, no wonder, seeing it spent the night on, on our bedside table. <laughs> Do you think I ought to shove it outside in the area so it can breathe, see? Not to the fact, Rita, I could do with a breath of air myself. Phew, what with one thing and another. I'll tell you what, Rita. What, see? Let's go down the pub and have a couple of pints. <laughs> Singers may come and singers may go, but some have that staying power which is the hallmark of the experienced artiste. Which is another way of saying we still haven't got rid of the Maxi Lang Harris male voice choir. It's bona to open up your ink and sing. It's bona to hear the open voices ring in a We'd like to send an urgent message to the president of our fan club, Mrs. Winifred Hoist of Crouch End. Come on, wouldn't we? Come yes, on. we would. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hello, Win, dear. I'm sorry I haven't rung you about my early romances as requested, but 
They're repainting our phone box. Mm, that's not the only reason you didn't ring her. No. No, no it isn't, is no, it? No, it's not. No. no. Mm. Who got red paint all over his crushed velvet safari jacket while passing the time of the day with a painter? Oh. Oh, I was cross. Mm. <laughs> First time I tried it on. Not according to the painter, <laughs> Said you've been trolling up and down in that jacket for days. Days you had been. And tell her what it was you offered to lend him. Oh, I can't. It's too hurtful. Go on. Tell everybody what I can't. Get on. Yes. Purge yourself. No. Purge. Get it out. No. You'll feel, be you'll feel the benefit after. No. Go no. On. Go oh. on. All right, then. <laughs> well, see, he was doing a bit of painting over his head, you see, and he chanced to say that he wished he had a roller, so I'd give him a lend of mine. <laughs> but it wasn't a paint roller, was it? No. 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 It's when I used to set my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap your eye around this, I say. <laughs> Wrap your eye around you, great custom. <laughs> and what vocal gem are you going to astonish us with today? Well, Chuck, <laughs> uh, we've had lots of requests for something really butch and stirry. Yeah. So, what have you come up with? The Grasshopper's Dance <laughs> by Bucalosi. I hope you're not going to dance as well. In these eels, so you must be chosen. <laughs> That's what you can do to walk. <laughs> Oh, grasshoppers live neat garden plants But have you ever seen grasshoppers dance? Well, you won't very often get the chance Cos grasshoppers don't like dancing They've tried to learn, but they can't be taught Cos their legs at the front are extremely short But the ones at the back are a different sort So grasshoppers don't like dancing Dear, with all them different sorts of legs Which trouser pocket do they keep their latch keys in? I always keep mine in my handbag <laughs> Oh, stop, stop banging it out. Come on, get on the set of Come on. Grasshoppers never can decide how to do a tango or a belly glide. They found that every time they tried, suddenly they'd all collide. Bang, Chuck. Now on their backs with their laddies waving in the air. Picture the scene. Oh, better not laugh. We won't be able to finish the song. <laughs> they'll jump in the air on New Year's Eve. They'll join in and sing Sweet Jackie Fever. I'll play them the waltz so and they all just leave. Because grasshoppers don't like it. Here, do you reverse? Well, if you'll be the fella, I'll follow. <laughs> Dancing. And now it's time for the Smith Report. Later in the programme, we'll be discussing long-distance lorry drivers. Are they taking things too far? <laughs> But first, here is the forecast for South East England. The weather will be cloudy with slight dull drizzle, but there's a chance of brighter drizzle later. <laughs> Which brings us to this week's main topic. The Smith Report looks at commerce. And if you want to know how to become self-employed, the answer is simple. Mind your own business. <laughs> but uh, what does the man in the street have to say? Commerce. I never have any trouble with commerce. What confuses me is semicolons. <laughs> well, actually, I do own a factory which makes seaside rock, and I recently made an enormous mistake by giving my head foreman a week's notice instead of sacking him on the spot. Why was that an enormous mistake? Yeah, do you know anybody who wants two miles of seaside rock with Get Knotted written right through it? <laughs> So much for public opinion, but what are the views of an expert? As a senior official at the Board of Trade, I consider that decreased productivity is the direct result of women being side by side with men on the factory floor. <laughs> how, can, how can a chap concentrate on the job with these lithe bodied, full bosomed young women? <laughs> or, <laughs> Fleshing their thighs in the summer, in the summer, sweet and, uh, uh, and these and these mini mini skirts make things even worse. If I had my way, I'd have all these girls drop their skirts to the floor. <laughs> Films 
have been released this week on the subject of big business, the United Nations documentary in which a Russian delegation visits a British factory to compare operational methods. Tell me, comrade, what hours do you work here? Well, let's see, like, we start about nine, work straight through to our pass, then have a tea break, and half ten, uh, twelve o'clock's an hour chair, to two, half past three, now tea break, till half four, and at five o'clock we knock off. In Russia, the workers work right through from seven in the morning until eight at night, with only half an hour break for lunch. Well, you never get them through that here, mate. They're already communists. <laughs> Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. Prendergast, what seems to be the trouble? Well, Doctor, it's my husband, really. You see, he goes around all day long thinking he's Frank Sinatra. And what do you want me to do about it? Please, Doctor, make him think it all night. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims in... No, stop messing about. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Well, at long last, I've been given the opportunity to do anything I want. The chance of a lifetime to say, in all seriousness... What is made of wood, pointed and wants to get on with people? What is made of wood... Eh? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a joke sent in to me by a listener. What is made of wood, pointed and wants to get on with people? I don't know. A pencil in a bus queue. <laughs> as the Spanish Inquisition. Oh, I, I know, but it's the way that he says it. He told it to me last night. He had me on the floor laughing. My dear. I, I, I don't need stuff sent to me by the public. I create my own. I have a naturally humorous bent. <laughs> Thank you. No comment. <laughs> Yes, go on, here. Yeah, tell you what, give me a subject. Give me a subject and I'll reply with your actual instant bomb no. All right, then. Um, animals. Animals. A man went into a pub and said, Mine's a light, and the barmaid poured a bucket of cold water all over him. <laughs> What's that? What's that got to do with animals? The pub was called the Dog and Duck. <laughs> Here, if, if Quasimodo married Rebecca, what would he be? Oh, dear, if he don't stop, I'll really get my rag out and strangle him with it. No, 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 come on. This is a really good one that's been sent in. All right, then. If Quasimodo married Rebecca, what would he be? The hunchback of Sunnybrook Farm. <laughs> <laughs> that is without doubt the unfunniest joke I've ever heard in my life. What idiot would go to the trouble of putting pen to paper to write that rubbish down? Never. Well, I had nothing better to do that evening, and I thought it was mildly amusing. <laughs> Douglas, it wasn't you. Well, I need the money. Mr. Paddock pays me a shilling for everyone he uses, and one in three if he gets a laugh. 
This really owes me about ninepence. Ah, and everyone wants to be a comic. I'll get on with your announcement. No, it's Crackerjack and Ori with Mother Time and Hotfoot from Tottsville in her seven-league gym shoes. Here comes Bouncing Maud Nethersoe. Hello, Chinese, and Biggies, too. Last night, I was taking a look at Gibbon's decline and fall. <laughs> what an experience it is, and what a lot we can learn from it. So here is one of my favorite episodes. It is not generally known that Attila the Hun had two aunts, Ethel and Florence, who were called the Attila Girls. <laughs> they were on a very good thing. They ran a small boarding house named The Vandal's Rest and had a large clientele of Franks, Goths, and Gauls. There were bear skins on all the beds and rushes on all the floors. <laughs> and sometimes vice versa. <laughs> evening at dinner, Ethel had just said, Now, would you like to try my prune shape? When a Roman general arrived called Maximus Licentius. He was returning from an orgy and had lost his bearings. <laughs> Hike, hock, he cried. Have you any room for me and my horses? Well, we don't allow horses in the bedrooms, said Ethel, but I expect we can fit you in if you don't mind sharing a bath with a goth. Have you any baggage? Uh, no, said the general. She fell off at the last corner. <laughs> but I do have some loot and a little booty. Perhaps you could help me. I'm having great trouble turning the heel. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think, Tiny's? Ethel and Florence spent all night with the general, showing him how to knit two together without getting too much tension in his welt. <laughs> now, wasn't that a lovely story? But now it's time for our song. Here's one that was a great favorite at the Colosseum in Rome. Even the lions used to sing it. I met him one night in a small trattoria. He said, Buena sera, and bit my left ear. He sat at my table, and when he cried, Vino, he blew all the froth off my large cappuccino. <laughs> he said, Uscusata, and I answered, Prego. We then had some soup looked rather like Sagal. He asked for the band to play Tana Sarento, then told me I think how to stuff a pimento. <laughs> we ate cannelloni, two sorts of salami, and then minestrone, then chili so much it was out of the question. And so we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables. But our story with the moral this week contains secret agents, spies, MI5, and every James Bond joke you've ever heard. <laughs> it's set in that hotbed of international espionage, Nidden Abbott. My name is Sutical. Farmer Sutical. <laughs> I, I, I employ a manual worker on my farm. He's a good lad, is Emmanuel. <laughs> he's now a good lad and he's engaged to my daughter Harriet but she's been getting worried because lately she's noticed something a bit queer about him Father Emmanuel's done it to me again oh. 
He's taken my tractor and gone to plough up the cornfield by the nuclear power station. Oh, what's wrong with that? Well, it's harvest time. That's what's wrong with that. He's not normal, that boy. Last week he took me up to that field, lay me down in the corn, and then... Yeah? ...started taking pictures of the nuclear power station. <laughs> well, I don't know what he's getting up to, but he's certainly getting up to it. Well, I don't know about that, but he's certainly not getting down to it. <laughs> oh, Emmanuel, do stop fiddling with your transmitter. <laughs> Here I am in the hayloft longing to be in your arms, and all you've done so far is put your aerial up. Are you? I'm trying to get through to HQ. Emmanuel, this Russian code book, this street map of Moscow, what does it all mean? All right, I confess. I'm a secret agent for a unnamed foreign power. I was blackmailed into it. Photographed in a compromising position at last year's Morris dance. Well, what's wrong with that? I was dancing with Morris. <laughs> Emmanuel, you, a traitor. Little did I realise when I was making love to you that I was nursing a viper in my bosom. Are you? Oh, you mean the spying? I'm far too involved to get out now. My contact in London would kill me. I'm vicious, Harriet. Huge brute of a man with cold killer's eyes and a grip of steel. And if he'd come through that barn door now, he'd square his massive shoulders and he'd say... Hello. <laughs> it's secret agent LC413 Oblique Stroke 827X. Yeah, but you can call me LC. <laughs> yeah, have you got any plans for me? Yeah, I think I'd introduce you to Morris. <laughs> No, don't be like that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a message coming through on the set. What's it say? Well, as far as I can work out, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> well, see, it says that MI5 are onto you. They're watching your every step. Oh, I'm not surprised, Ducky. I'm a lovely little mover. <laughs> No, that says we must get all the secret plans and microfilms that, I, that I've taken from the nuclear power station and smuggle them to London. Mm, go on, go on. Yeah. <laughs> I know what. I'll put them all in this empty milk churn here and hide the churn in a lorry full of grain, which happens by a strange coincidence to be outside with the engine running. He's very good, you know. He's getting me all worked up. Yeah. <laughs> I've got an even better plan. Can you drive? Well, I'm only a learner. A learner? Well, my car may have L on the front, Ducky, but it's Evan in the back. <laughs> well, we'll take that chance. You drive the green lorry to London while I drive a identical lorry full of cows, pigs and chicken to Exeter as a decoy. It cannot fail! What a performance! <laughs> How we got passed over in the birthday honours this day, I'll never know. <laughs> On and on I drove until at last I reached the outskirts of London. I could tell I was in London because I was hitting more pedestrians. <laughs> Finally, I arrived at my rendezvous near Big Ben at midnight, exactly on time. <laughs> All right, so I was an hour late. <laughs> My Russian contact was waiting. Ah, comrade LC. Have you the secret plans and the microfilms? Yes, I have. They're all hidden in a milk churn in the back of this lorry loaded with grain. I'll just open the doors. <laughs> <laughs> And the moral of this week's story is... It's a wrong load that has no churning. It's said that the rain in Spain falls mainly on the tourists. <laughs> but in this part of the world, it always seems to be falling on the long-suffering head of our problem man of the week. My name is Clarence J. Mouse Partner, and I seem to be 
Could be living on the edge of a precipice. Well, move. I, I haven't finished. A precipice of doubt and uncertainty. You see, for years I have been afflicted with chronic digititis. Oh, I am sorry. Whatever does it mean? It means that in moments of stress, I lose all control of my right index finger. It sort of wanders off and hides itself in any adjacent orifice. Does it? Yes. Of course, this has led to many an unfortunate misunderstanding. <laughs> So now when I am talking to people, I always shove my finger in my right ear <laughs> so that I will know where it is. <laughs> you may have noticed. Well, I wasn't going to mention it. I thought you were just trying to keep it warm. Uh, now nah, I'm keeping it under control. If it pops off anywhere, I'll notice. <laughs> yes, uh, you'll hear better too. Pardon? <laughs> Not important. Uh, must be a great handicap, keeping your finger in your ear. Oh, it is, yes. Uh, <laughs> especially if you happen to be a concert pianist. And uh, are you? I am, yes, oh. yes. <laughs> but one with a rather limited repertoire. Can you play anything at all? Oh, yes, yes. Ravel's concerto for the left hand. But of course I have to remove the finger of my right hand occasionally to turn over the music. I see. Mm. Can't you play by ear? <laughs> I can, yes, but unfortunately only with my right ear. Which is already occupied with my fingers. <laughs> But you could put your finger in your left ear if you turned your head slightly. Yes, but then I can't see the piano. <laughs> Surely, if you did it from behind... With a finger like mine, you don't do anything from behind. <laughs> it seems an insoluble problem. It is, yes. So yesterday I... I bought a revolver. I locked myself in my room. I took my finger out of my ear and I prepared to do away with myself. Any luck? <laughs> well, just as I was about to pull the trigger, I realised that, that I'd, I'd, yes? I'd got my finger stuck in the barrel. <laughs> Urban redevelopment schemes are altering many familiar landmarks. The friendly grocer on the corner has become an unfriendly grocer in the middle of a motorway. But are we protesting about these improvements? For instance, take Sid and Rita Dipfinger. <laughs> I haven't. And if you had, I'm sure I'd have noticed. <laughs> Why, Charles Creed? Well, this young man come round from the town hall asking a lot of personal questions, Sid. He wanted to measure my frontage, dear. But all on his own, really. Did he have a theodolite? Well, I don't he never took his hat off. <laughs> Disgraceful, I mean. I'm you, um, and you a married woman. Well, exactly. Then he looks me right between the eyes and says, Mrs. Dickfinger, you're going to be redeveloped. <laughs> oh, if he looked a bit lower, he'd have seen he was wasting his time. <laughs> You, you know, you know what he was after, Rita, don't you? Well, I've got a pretty good idea. Oh, it? no, it's our, it's our front garden, Rita. I've heard they want to turn it into London's new airport. <laughs> oh, Sid, we'll never get a wink of sleep with all those supersonic bangs in the small hours. <laughs> Dear. 
Now, for the passengers and crew of a jumbo jet, we haven't. No. And you know what it's like after a long journey, Rita. I do, dear. And another thing, I'm not having my front room turned into a lounge for R.I.P.'s sake. <laughs> What'll happen? Well, same as usual, I suppose, but with an audience. <laughs> And I'll ring up the Prime Minister and tell him. Yes. I'll tell him where to shove his airport. Oh, dear. And if he can't, tell him to put it in Mrs Ogden's next door. <laughs> now it's time for the Smith Report. <laughs> Later in the programme, we'll be discussing menthol inhalers. Do they get up your nose? <laughs> Which brings us to this week's main topic. <laughs> the Smith Report investigates the cinema. Why do they keep us in the dark? What does the man in the street have to say? Well, well oh, I've just been to the pictures to see the first ever nudist western. None of the cowboys had any clothes on it at all. But the sheriff, just to prove he was really tough, he still pinned his badge on. <laughs> what are the views of an expert? As an official of the British Board of Film Censors, I think there's far too much sex in the cinema. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't mean on screen, I mean in the back row. There's a young men cavorting with, with lithe-bodied, hard, full bosom, <laughs> mini-skirted girls, Flashing their, their thighs <laughs> and the usherettes torching. <laughs> oh, yes. I was at my local cinema last week when this, cup, this couple got so embarrassing that I was absolutely disgusted. I, in fact, I was forced to turn round and, and watch the film instead. <laughs> Smith Report now rips aside the glintsel and titter of the silver screen. <laughs> Take a look behind the scenes of the film industry, where the director's shooting the execution scene from the life and times of Charles II. Quiet on the set, please! Yeah, right, right. Now, Rodney, in this shot, all that happens is you place your head on the block and Harry here as the executioner raises the axe. Then in the finished film, we show reaction shots of the crowd as the axe falls and we put in sound effects, that sort of thing. Nothing to worry about. All right, cameras, action. Raise the axe, Harry. OK, cut. <laughs> <laughs> Cinema in the 70s has almost reached the ultimate in permissiveness. Today, the Smith Report goes one step further by presenting a radio adaptation of the first erotic cartoon feature entitled, for reasons you can work out for yourselves, Snow White and the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> Droopy, Dozy, Mick, and Titch. <laughs> Hi there, fellas. You're late tonight. We've been down the mine. You know, 16 tons, and what do you get? A high-pitched voice like this. <laughs> oh, well, it's almost my bedtime, so who's going to be first tonight? Me! <laughs> to help me with the washing up. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and work out my treble chance coupon. Is that all you think about, Droopy? Draws? <laughs> well, somebody's 
she's got to help me. What about you? Mm? <laughs> You'll help me because you know what the reward is afterwards, don't you? Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't, because I'm dopey. You're worse than that. You're downright stupid. Hey, Doc. Yep. Did you call into the chemist and get what I asked you to? Nope. Nope, but there was a woman serving, and you know how shy I am. Oh, but I only wanted my photographs back. <sighs> All right, well, I suppose that someday my prints will come. Snow White, what do you mean your prints will come? Well, according to the storyline, a handsome Prince is due to come and take me away from the squalor that we live in to the squalor that he lives in. <laughs> He'll be a tall, dark, beautiful man with bedroom eyes and a flashing smile. And if he walked through that door now, he'd square his massive shoulders and say... Hello. <laughs> oh, no, Douglas, it's not you again. It's bad enough you're turning up twice without pinching my entrance line. Well, actually, Mr Williams, I not only write terrible jokes, I write terrible sketches as well. So, as the author, I thought I'd give myself a part. Oh, all right, then. Two can play that game, Miss Clever Clocks. Here we go. <clears throat> Which brings us to the end of the Smith Report and also the programme. Just time for a quick word from Miss Jensen. I don't know what's so new about topless swimsuits. I was wearing one when I was five years old. <laughs> Stop Missing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and the Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Raj and David Cunning and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. And the announcer was Douglas Smith. Catch a Right then, I've got the cards ready. Cards? Oh, dear, it's always the same with you. Whenever I come here, you insist on playing strip poker. <laughs> that makes it more fun, doesn't it? I suppose so, yes, but why don't you just say, go behind the screen and take your clothes off like the other doctor does? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock and Joan Sims in... Stop messing about. Hello and welcome. Well, this week, as is the last programme in the series, I've written out a little speech, which is here in my inside pocket. So, with your permission, I'll whip it out and give it a whirl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am to Hello, any kind Oh, what's wrong with you? You look as though you've just eaten your pillow. <laughs> uh, down in the mouth. <laughs> I'm in no mood for jokes today. It's all over between us. Aye? Our affair, Ken. It's finished. I don't know about you, mate, but I guess I never even started. Here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Aye? Talking about Joan and me, oh. she's... Oh. <laughs> she's broken it off. <laughs> she's left me for another man. I take the coward's way out. If I weren't such a coward. Come on, boy. Here she is, so brazen, flaunting herself in that low-cut dress. Oh, Kenny! <laughs> Kenny, I'm so excited, I can hardly contain myself. We can all see that. <laughs> Thank you. Bosoms are in this year. Precisely in, not out. <laughs> well, he likes my dress, so there. Does he, indeed? No, hold on a minute. Who's he? Jezebel. Funny name for a fella. <laughs> he is my new lover, 
And it's the real thing this time. That's what you kept saying to me, sitting on your sofa with the lights down low. All right, stop it. You've gone far enough. Kept saying that as well. <laughs> Goodbye, cruel world! Oh, well, come on, now he's gone. Tell us, who is your lovely new fellow? Oh, Ken, he's gorgeous. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tall and handsome and cultured. Oh. oh, how well I remember the first words he said to me. Well, I'll give it a secret. What did he say? Well, as far as I recall, Mr. Williams, uh, <laughs> I said, hello, gorgeous. How do you fancy a quick snog in the back row of the Regal? Put him down! Put him down! Put him down, woman! He's got an announcement to make. Go on, Don Juan. Get on. Very well. Hi there, girls. <laughs> this is your sensuous sex symbol of the 70s. Saying to you. Uh, stop hanging it out! <laughs> this week, Cracker Jack and Ollie with Mother takes a trip up the Ganges. And with a joss stick behind her ear and a puppet arm tucked in her dhoti, here's Memsab Maud Nethersoul. Hello, tinies, and biggies too. <laughs> there was once a young elephant called Louise who wanted to be an air hostess on a jumbo jet. Well, one day, Louise was trying to convince a hippopotamus that he was traveling at 6,000 feet and would be shortly arriving at London Airport when she realized that someone was standing behind her. Never mind how she knew she did. <laughs> it was her childhood sweetheart, Tusky Roger, who joined the Foreign Legion to forget and be discharged because he couldn't. <laughs> and he said, uh, Louise, old fruit, that night when we held trunks beneath the banana tree, do you remember what we did? And Louise replied, Father, you're not petty pant. <laughs> yes, it was all very unfortunate, said Roger, but I think I know why we slipped up. We should never have peeled the banana first. <laughs> and he led her off into the forest and taught her a lovely song he'd learned in the army all about coconuts. <laughs> so now she doesn't want to be an air hostess anymore because she's found that it's much more fun on the ground. <laughs> He sat down in a position which went quite a bit too far. He started singing a ballad which lasted into the night. I thought this refrain sounds like someone in pain and I found when I switched on the line. I was right I said now don't overdo it Put down that long thing with strings Have a crumpet and please pass the cruet And we'll chat about various things But as you look so exhausted before you sing your next song If I might suggest you should take a short rest Cause I don't think you look very strong I was wrong <laughs> So we come to our regular feature, Feeble Fables, and as we already seem to be in the Mystic East, we might as well stay there. My name is Bucket, Edna Bucket. <laughs> My husband and I were in Cahoots, a little town in the Middle East. We were on our treacle moon. That's the same as a honeymoon, only not so refined. Boom, boom. <laughs> We were in our hotel room having a drink before 
your dinner when there was a knock on the beaded curtain. They are sound effects. Get out of that. <laughs> Get that, will you? But I'm not dressed. I can't open the door in my combination. Well, turn round and I'll have a go. No! <laughs> See you, witty. <laughs> it's an Eastern gentleman. I've seen him before somewhere. I don't know the name, but the face is familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to all and sundry. Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> Honestly, though, no, for the last show, you'd think they'd try harder, wouldn't you? <laughs> Don't they get paid as well for writing this rubbish? Not just the honour of working with me. <laughs> oh, what are you saying, sir? I don't think we've had the pleasure. Well, you should know it's your honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do? My name is Bucket. M.T. Bucket. <laughs> For you. Madam, I am here to tell you that my master, the Shah, has seen you in the marketplace and admires your fragile beauties. <laughs> does he? He does. And he wishes to purchase your wife for his harem. He said to me, here's a ducket, go by bucket. <laughs> He has 365 wives already. Yes, but next year's leap year. <laughs> he wants to complete the set. But she's my wife. She stood at the altar and said, I do. I did. And by golly, she does. <laughs> but not with any shower, I don't. I didn't sleep at all that night, wondering what dreadful consequences would be caused by our defiance of the shower. Suddenly... Another knock on the beaded curtain. <laughs> I put on the light and there he stood. A fine figure of a man, bronzed and handsome, with a flashing smile. And as he looped to my Edna, he squared his massive shoulders and said... I know. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful man, standing there in your flowing robes, flashing your scimitar. <laughs> put it away, do you know, could he? Stand back. Bucket. Not so much of the bucket. I've got a handle to my name. Please, do not fight, for I too love this stranger. I shall follow him to the four corners of the earth. No need to go that far. <laughs> I'll set for the one corner of my tent. Edna, you can't leave me now. We're on our honeymoon. And I've booked two seats on tomorrow's Shadowbank tour to Casbah. No, Morris. I must go with him. But I'll be on my own. You'll ruin our holiday because of this potentate who's hardly got two brass farthings to rub together. And the moral of this week's story is... Don't spoil the trip for April the Shah. <laughs> And now, looking on the bright side, but facing the wrong way, here is our problem man of the week. My name is Clarence J. Mouse, partner, and I... I don't want to say anything. You can't have finished. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, I haven't started. <laughs> so anything to cause distress to my listening loved ones. But the fact is, my lady wife keeps getting these phone calls from the Archbishop. <laughs> really? Is he a close friend of your wife's? Well, hardly, cos we live in Wimbledon. <laughs> The Virgin on the Common, you know. Well, never mind. <laughs> well, I'm sure that wouldn't bother the Archbishop. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to. And only trouble is, it, it isn't really the Archbishop at all. How do you know? Because it's me. <laughs> if I told you that I'll ring up and say, Hello, this is the Archbishop speaking, what would be your response? Amen. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, never mind, never mind. Uh, but why do you do it? To try and save my marriage. You see, in the boastful moment, I promised her that I'd be the Archbishop by the time I was 30. And how old are you now? 41. <laughs> 
And they haven't given me an interview yet. <laughs> I daren't tell my wife. Of course not. No. That's why I keep calling her from a phone box to say that Clarence J. Mouse partner will be top of the list when the job falls vacant. <laughs> but I'm beginning to think they've passed me over. Have they been in touch with you at all? Well, they did send me an appeal for the rebuilding fund, but that hardly constitutes a definite offer, does it? Hardly, no. And I couldn't afford to send much because I just bought one of those long cloak things and a hat like a tea cosy. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wore them yesterday when I phoned my wife. It must be rather awkward getting into a phone box. I suppose they helped to add authenticity. Yes, they helped get me in the front of the queue as well. <laughs> but while I was talking to my wife, something rather upsetting happened. You didn't excommunicate yourself. Oh, no. <laughs> but this vicar poked his head round the door and... and well, to cut a long story short, now I've got another little problem. What's that? Well, next Sunday I'm preaching the sermon at Westminster Abbey. <laughs> Statistics tell us that less and less people are having birthdays, which seems a pretty good reason for not listening to statistics. Luckily, quite a lot of people don't. For example, take Sid and Rita Dipfinger. Sid? A Bansal birthday celebration? Bansal birthday celebrations, dear. Do you feel up to doing what you did last? <laughs> oh no, Rita. It made a change, of course, but I don't think I want to do it again. Oh, but the neighbours are all looking forward to it. <laughs> I mean, Mrs. Ogden says it would give her great pleasure to hold the ladder, dear. <laughs> say it would, but last time I strained me back. So this year I'm not hanging that Union Jack on the TV aerial, even if it is my birthday. Oh, well, we must do something, Sid. I might shove a spotlight under me ornamental urn, Rita. Oh, no, Sid. I need that urn for the fruit cup at the fork luncheon. There were some very nasty comments last year when I was laying it out of the spin dryer. <laughs> Surprised. I had a ball of fluff and a button in mine. <laughs> and this year, if you're going to put whelks in your volavent, I'd take them out of their shells first. Well, as soon as they've all got their forks, Sid, we're having sausage toad a la Putney High Street <laughs> with an egg custard on the side for them as can't chew. And for laughters, we'll all have a nice Macedonian seat. Oh, no, Richie, you're not inviting a lot of foreigners. <laughs> no, dear, a, Mace a Macedonian of fruit. Oh! It's sort of a compost. <laughs> Next to your sister Glad, or when her beads start bouncing up and down, I always forget the word. Same as last year. Well, I thought this time we'd do it a bit different this year. Oh, you don't mean... Yes, dear, I'll dry up and you can wear the Kiss Me Quick apron. 
And now we flood the air with a melody brought to you by that well-known shower, the Maxi Length Harris Male Voice Choir. It's Bona to open up your ink and sing. It's Bona to hear the Obi voices ring. In harmony. And my friend here has got a vital bit of news for all our fans. Vital. Tell them about our Omi Voice Choir Festival, Ducky. Shall I? Yes, go on. Tell them where we've decided to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> the Isle of Man. <laughs> 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 The Isle of Dogs. Oh, what a location. Shut your mouth. Oh, what a location, Ducky. And for them living in Crouch End, there's a bus leaving at 2.30 on the Friday from the Working Men's Club. <laughs> Tickets in advance from Mrs Winifred Hoist. Yes, hello, in love. In advance, yes, because on the actual day, she'll be driving the bus. Mm, she will, she will, if she passes her test in time. Oh, she'll pass, love, sure, too. Her instructor's an old mate of mine. Mm. That's what's worrying me. Mm. <laughs> Never passed yours, did you? Hmm? Mm. Not the driving one, anyway. <laughs> well, I needed more lessons. You had 420 of them. <laughs> Be having them still if he hadn't put his foot down. Oh, yes. Right on my slingback wet looks. <laughs> oh, I was cross. Yes, she was cross. What about this week's musical offering? Well, Chuck... <laughs> uh, we've been thinking a lot recently about Fred Mendelssohn. Felix! Felix! Felix. You're great now, no, oh. not Fred. I sigh whenever Mendelssohn sat down and played his mum would always interrupt and say, let's have a sing song. She'd sing, we'll get the lilacs and some Julian Slade. And then she used to talk all through his spring song. Oh, shame. 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 It's a lovely little piece, his spring song. It is, Ducky. It's nice to hear the spring song springing. Nice to hear the birdies singing. It gives you, so to speak, a smile upon your ink. The omis and pelones, they dance round in a circle. We move their shirts and then their pants and... Hey, 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 hang on! Hang on! Hang on! It's a spring song, not a striptease, ducky. Oh, shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That last accelerando carried me away then. Well, if you go any further, you're going to be run in, you are. Now, come on, get back to the song. Yes. Mm. And so, when we invited Mendelssohn to tea, we said, we want to hear you play, so please don't bring your mother. And as there's just the two of us, my friend, and me, to even up the numbers, bring your brother. <laughs> And now it's time for the Smith Report. In this edition, the Smith Report investigates the entire world. Is it just going round in circles? First, what are the views of an expert? Uh, as a member of the world community, I must confess I've changed my mind about sex. Perhaps it is a good thing after all. All these lithe-bodied, full-bosomed young girls walking about in their short little dresses, flashing their, their thighs. Right. Oh, in the air. And the summer sunshine. And, and so I say, up with miniskirts. Several films have been released this week, all set somewhere in the world. Our first excerpt reveals the true reason for the famous St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's for not sending me a card! Our second excerpt takes place in the frozen north in an Eskimo's igloo. My son, sit on my knee. I will read you a nursery rhyme. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Little Jack Horner sat in the corner. Daddy, 
Yes, my son? What is a corner? <laughs> Next, a cottage in the Welsh Valleys. An anxious mother receives a phone call from her daughter, who has left home to go to London. Hello? <laughs> Gareth, it's our daughter, Bloodwen. <laughs> You've moved from where you were, dear? Because you were in the family's way? <laughs> oh, best thing then. You're in the club. Oh, nice for you then, meet other people. You've got what? Oh, shan't keep you then if you've got something in the oven. Bye bye. <laughs> what a relief, Gareth. I was so worried she'd get herself into trouble. <laughs> So, finally, in the Smith Report, our massed cast of three. Join me in our anthem, which is a plea for laughter, happiness and friendship throughout the entire world. Will everybody please rise? <laughs> in the present series of Stop Messing About with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Joan Sims and Max Harris Group. The script was by Miles Rudge and David Cumming and Derek Collier. The producer was John Simmons. <laughs>